I would like to introduce my favorite person. <laughs> um, if, I don't know if any of y'all saw my Facebook page today. I didn't tell Robbie that I did this, but I posted a picture of him when he was 15. <laughs> we met when he was 14, and it's, he's so cute. But my, my grandmother is 95, and she still calls him my little redheaded boy. I posted that and said if he was awesome then, but he is different, a different kind of awesome now. So I'm introducing to you Robbie Clark. He's going to speak on Jonah chapter 3. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Betty, I see you're back. Glad you're back from Greece. Good to see you and good to see everybody here. Um, I do want to talk about Jonah 3 tonight, but I want to reiterate what Chip said last, last week. The book of Jonah is a story from beginning to end. It's not, you can't divide it up and, and sort of teach on one chapter without pulling from the chapters before and the chapters after because it, it tells a full story. <clears throat> and Jonah 3, and, and the book of Jonah is a strange book. It really is because you have a reluctant prophet, God's man, who disobeys God. He's not the hero of the story. In, in every other book in the Bible, you expect God's man to do the right thing, to deliver the message, to come through. Even, even if he messed up, he's at least correctable. Well, you have none of that in Jonah. Jonah, even by the end of the book in Jonah, Jonah's just like shaking his fist at God and saying, I'm not doing it. I don't want to do this. I hate these people. I mean, it is a strange book. So why did God give the job of going and offering forgiveness and mercy to Jonah's enemies? Why did he give it to Jonah? He knew what Jonah felt in his heart. This, this book, from beginning to end, is like one ongoing Transforming You session <laughs> between God and Jonah. God was intentionally provoking him to have to choose, are you going to forgive these people that you hate? And Jonah didn't come out. He didn't fare too well. In fact, the sailors in the story, the Ninevites in the story, had more faith in Jonah's God than Jonah had in his own God. It's, it's crazy. They actually showed more godly character and compassion than Jonah did. So the Lord was not only after Nineveh, he was after Jonah and the sailors. And what do they say? Two out of three ain't bad. That's what he got. He only got the sailors and the Ninevites. As far as we know, at least as where the book ended, Jonah was not repentant. So, the book of Jonah ends with God trying to reason with him and say, listen, son, you're, you're sorry that this plant just died, but what about 120,000 people down there? Do you not have compassion for them? And it's almost like he's standing there with his fist raised to God in his anger and his self-righteousness and saying, I don't have compassion for him, and you can't make me. Now, that's a, that is a... A very scary thing. This is God's own man that he handpicked. <clears throat> so let me give you a little history and background on Nineveh. And you will start to understand why Jonah has such a hard time with the, the city of Nineveh. Um, it was the capital city of Assyria. Uh, it was in modern-day Iraq, Mosul. Y'all heard Mosul in the news. Mosul sort of built around the remains of Nineveh. It's on the, the Tigris River. Um, at, the, at this time, between 700 and 600 B.C., it was the largest city in the world. 120,000 people. At its height, I think it had 150,000. It's about twice the size of Babylon at the time. Um, it was a fairly large city, seven and a half miles around. It had a big wall, seven and a half miles around it. Uh, Fifteen gates had canal because it was on the Tigris River, they had canals and irrigation ditches just cut all into the city. So the city looked like 
It had parks and gardens. It looked like a South American jungle. So think about this. If you're, if you're a, a living, living in the desert, taking care of sheep or something, and you decide to go to Nineveh, go to town, and you're coming from the arid or semi-arid landscape, and you come to the gates of Nineveh, and they throw open the gates, and you look inside, and it looks like the Amazon. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous place. They, they were uh, a very wealthy city. The Assyrians would go and conquer different nations, and they would plunder everything. They took it all. They, they were not uh, gentle uh, victors. So they took everything, and they would take it back to Nineveh and store it up. So it was a very wealthy city. Now, Jonah didn't have a problem with the city. He had a problem with the people that lived in the city. The, the Assyrians were a vicious, violent, wicked, sadistic even, uh, hard-hearted people. So think like Attila the Hun or Stalin or Hitler. And the problem is, Assyria had defeated Israel. And you sort of get the sense that there's something else going on here. Jonah's reaction of, about giving them forgiveness and mercy, his reaction was so strong. This is not just prejudice. This is not just, I don't like your culture. This is not racism. There's something else here. We don't know what it is, but it almost feels personal. Like, like there's his wife or his kids or his family or his friends. Somebody got hurt badly. And he's like, I hate those people. And I'm not, I'm not going to forgive them. I'm not going to have any part of that. So think, think of this. Just imagine this for a minute. Imagine it's 1943. <clears throat> Nazi Germany is at its peak of its power. Hitler's destroying Jews as fast as he can go. Imagine if God said to a young Jewish boy slash man, go to Berlin. Go to Berlin. Offer the Nazis and Hitler forgiveness and mercy. That, that feels different, doesn't it? And guess what? What if, he, what if Hitler took it? This is, this is why this, this thing was so hard for Jonah to do. I mean, it was tough. So I'm going to try to read through chapter 3. The problem is, I didn't want to wear my glasses, so I printed it out here. In New, I like New Living Translation. But up there, it's New King James. You know what? I don't think I can do that. I think I'm going to have to read it up there. Okay, Jonah 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. It took three days to see the entire city. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of, of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and turn from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and, and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they, that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. So you can, you can understand in chapter 4 that Jonah's disappointed. He actually wanted the city to be destroyed. Um, I want to talk about the extras in the story. I want to talk about the sailors and the king and the nobles for just a minute. 
Then I want to talk about Jonah and his heart condition. And then I want to talk about how that applies to us. Okay? So, <clears throat> there were three instances of compassion and godly character in this story, and none of them had to do with God's man. He had no part in any of it. <clears throat> the sailors in chapter 1, they, they're th- this storm, this giant storm comes up, and they realize this is no normal storm. And so they think in their minds, one of our gods that we worship must be mad at one of us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. So the sailors came to Jonah and said, hey, what have you done? He said, I disobeyed my God. I'm running away from him. And they said, well, how do we stop this? He said, you've only got one option. Throw me overboard. Now, watch what they did next. It says, then they rode even harder to try to reach land. They're trying to save the joker that caused the storm. Isn't it? These are pagan idol worshipers. Yet they show more compassion and godly character than Jonah does. They, they're trying to save his life by rowing as hard as they can. It's amazing. So this is what they said when they realized they couldn't outrun the storm. They just couldn't do it. They tried as hard as they could. It says, then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. O Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now, Remember I said the Lord was after uh, Nineveh, Jonah, and the sailors. Well, you can check one off because he got the sailors. When they saw his great power, they said, whoa. They offered sacrifices, and they vowed to serve him. That's amazing. That, that, to me, that blows me away. Now, the king and his nobles also showed compassion. Just think about this. What would happen if we, we had a threat on Washington, D.C., a nuclear threat on Washington, D.C., what would the, our nobles, our leaders do? Hide? Yeah, that's right. The, the president, the vice president, Congress, Supreme Court, they would, be, they would go to different bunkers where they could protect themselves. What happens to the Joe Blow down in Virginia? Too bad. So look what the... And these nobles, the king and the nobles could have done the same thing. They could have waited till day 39 after they, after they heard the prophecy. 40 days, and that's it. They could have waited till day 39. They could have got all their wealth. They could have got their servants to, to make sure their family was safe, and they could have headed off to the lake house and watched none of a burn. They could have protected themselves. They, they had the resources to do it. They could have got out of there, and they could have saved all their money. They could have got their kids. But what about the other 120,000 people? They sent a letter, a decree out to the whole city. Look, we're all in this together. Everybody, nobody eats. Nobody drinks. None of your animals get to eat or drink. We're all to pray. We're going to turn from our evil ways and turn from our violence. That is stunning to me that they showed that much compassion for their, the other people in the city that could not protect themselves, that could not run away. That blows my mind. The third instance of compassion is God himself. Now, we know God is full of compassion. We know that. But just think about this. This is his children's mortal enemies. These guys were so nasty that when they would come in and defeat a country, it wasn't enough to defeat them. They wanted to torture them. They wanted to kill their babies in front of them. There, there, there was some, uh, they found some relief uh, carvings uh, in Nineveh, and it showed, I mean, this was their art. It showed people skinning somebody else alive. I mean, they would behead people, poke people's eyes out, rip their tongues out. 
All this kind of crazy stuff. In fact, whenever they defeated a king, they would put them in the palace like as a trophy. Pull his tongue out, poke his eyes out, whatever. So whenever visiting emissaries came, they saw the power of the king of Assyria. Got eight or ten defeated kings just sitting around at your table. These guys were rough. So God had to say in his own heart, look, they've hurt my children, but I'm going to offer them forgiveness and mercy anyway. Now, when somebody hurts us, that's one thing. When somebody goes after our kids, what happens? (laughs) I've seen some mamas rise up. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, so how did God, I mean, it's, it's, we know God's full of compassion, but even this, he showed how, how awesome of a God he is. The forgiveness and mercy that he gave to those rascals. Now I want to talk a little bit about the king and his humility. <clears throat> During this time and in this culture, the king's word was law. If he saw your daughter and he wanted her for a wife, he just took her. If he saw your son look like a good soldier, he would take him. If he wanted your land, he would take him. He would take it. Now, the problem is, once you start living that way for a while and you get everything you want, your arrogance and your pride and your ego just goes through the roof. And that's how these kings behaved. They got what they wanted when they wanted it, and they didn't care. But look at this story. It says that the king stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. When Jonah uttered the most pitiful eight-word sermon in history, 40 days and Nineveh's going to be destroyed. That's it? Are you kidding me? These hard-hearted people. I mean, does that sound like a convincing sermon to you? It doesn't to me. But this king somehow showed humility. He, He took off his robes and stepped off his throne, and he was saying, I'm the king, but I'm not the king of kings. Isn't that amazing? Now, let me tell you something that makes it even more amazing. In those days, when nation would fight nation, the victorious nation, whoever won, would assume that their gods were stronger than the gods of the defeated nation. Right? So Assyria had already defeated Israel. So here's this joker coming in from a little tiny sliver of land, the nation of Israel, several hundred miles away, And one guy shows up, not a rich caravan with gifts or not an emissary from the king, just a guy. He shows up in the city and says, you remember that that little nation y'all destroyed? That nation, that little tiny one? Well, I just want to tell you, I serve that God of that nation, and he says, you got 40 days. Now, they should have laughed him out of the city. Because in their mind, what they were thinking is, wait a minute, Our, we defeated you. If your God was going to destroy us, why didn't he do it then? We're, our God is stronger than your God. But that's not what happened. I think what happened, <clears throat> when God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, and he said, no way, and he split to the coast. I believe that the Spirit of God went to Nineveh ahead of him. I believe he did. And, and as he's there, he begins softening those hard-hearted Assyrian hearts. I'm telling you. He, God was at work. There is no possible way that eight-word sermon should have worked like that. No possible way unless God was at work because he knew what he was going to do. I've heard people say, what kind of prophet was this guy? Are you telling me he didn't know God any better than this than to think he could run away from him? He knew God. Here's what he knew about God. God's character was one full of compassion, full of grace, and full of mercy. He knew that no matter how bad those Assyrians were, 
if God offered them forgiveness and mercy and they took it, then he would forgive it all. That's what he was afraid of. And God had already told him, he had already given him the message, 40 days. Now, I think that Jonah wasn't sure when that uh, timer started. I think what he was thinking, well, if I can run that way as fast and as far as I can go, it, if God turns me around, maybe I won't have time to get back before they're destroyed. Or maybe he was thinking, I'll run this way as far as I can go, and he'll have to get somebody else. He, I don't think he thought he could actually get away from God. I really don't. I, I think we need to give him a little more credit than that. Now, I'll we'll talk about Jonah for just a few minutes. <clears throat> and this, I like this. The first verse in chapter 3, and it says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. That's important to me. I don't know if it's important to you guys, but I grew up, I don't think I was taught this, but, I, but this is what I understood. If I do something wrong, if I disobey God or I disappoint him, then he might not talk to me for a while. He, you know, I've always heard, well, if you can't hear from God, go back to the last thing he told you to do and go do that. And there may be some truth in that, I don't know. But the way I, the way I heard it was, if you don't obey me, I'm going to go sulk. And I'm not going to talk to you for a few days until I'm not mad anymore. I, and that always was like a heavy thing. Because we all disappoint God at different times. We just do that. And to think that, okay, there has to be a cooling off period of five days, ten days, thirty days, whatever it is. I hated that. I always hated that. But this, God says to him, I, when he spoke to him a second time, we know it was immediate because he said, get up and go to Nineveh. He's still laying on the beach. At the end of chapter 2, the verse says, the great fish spit Jonah up onto the beach. So he's laying there in whale spit and seaweed all over him, and God speaks to him a second time. It is immediate. And he says, get up and go do what I told you to do. I like that. I really like that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Jonah's repentance in chapter 2. <clears throat> Chip spoke on it last week and did a really good job. But that was a hard chapter to... to to try to figure out, because uh, he repents, but he only repents of his disobedience. He doesn't repent of his motivation. That's why I said this, this is like one ongoing transforming you session. Yes, he did repent. We know that his confession and his repentance was true and authentic, because as soon as he got up after he had repented, he turned around and he went to Nineveh. He did what he, what he told God he would do. But he, he never took care of the motivation in his heart. You can read chapter 4. He still hates their guts. And he's going to sit there hoping that he gets to watch it catch on fire. So his repentance was incomplete, but it was enough for him to move to the next step. Jonah despised these people so much that he would rather have died than to offer them forgiveness and mercy. When he told the sailors, just toss me into the sea, he didn't know that, that God had prepared a fish to come by and swallow him. They're, what, 50, 100 miles from shore? He just assumes when they toss him overboard, he's done. But he's... At least the way I read it in the scripture, he's cool, calm, and collected. He's like, just throw me overboard. I mean, I get the impression he would rather die than have any part in this forgiveness thing for his enemies. In chapter 4, he says this, after God relents and doesn't destroy uh, the nation, he says, just kill me now. <laughs> just kill me now, Lord. That's what he says. He says that to God. Just kill me now. <laughs> I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Now, that's some strong, deep unforgiveness right there. 
He says later, the sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. This guy is plenty willing to go to his grave. He would rather go to his grave than he would to offer forgiveness and mercy. That's a dangerous level of unforgiveness, y'all. So, my question to you tonight is, who is your Nineveh? Who's hurt you? Uh, if God told you to go to that person and offer them forgiveness and mercy, would you do it? Or would you tell him no? And I want that to just sort of, just chew on that for a few minutes. So, I know some of you have heard this story, uh, the ones in Transforming You and NC Lead, but it fits. My story when I came here to New Covenant Church was, like Jonah, I was carrying unforgiveness with me. I, th there was somebody in my family that was fairly close that I just could not forgive of stuff in the past. I mean, I did everything that I knew to do. Read the scriptures, read the books on forgiveness, memorized the scriptures, claimed, proclaimed, all that stuff that they tell you to do, and I could not beat it. And I was in prison. I was in bondage. And I couldn't get out. I mean, originally, when, when that whole process started, I'm thinking, I'm going to cause them pain. I'm going to hold them responsible for this stuff and they are going to pay. They didn't pay. I did. So, my question again is, who is your Nineveh? Who has hurt you? Who would you not offer forgiveness and mercy to, even if God told you to? I want you to think about that. I want to take about two minutes. Think about that. Because the, the name and the face has already jumped into your mind. There may be more than one. It's already, it's already there. If you go to a family reunion and, and your insides clench up, when you see them, that's the one. So what I want you to do tonight is I don't want you to try to forgive everything. Sometimes those things that we, they're just so big. You know, forgiving the whole thing in one, at one time is, is almost unrealistic. But what I'd like for you to do is, like Jonah, he, met, he took one step forward. He repented of his disobedience, and that was enough for that moment to move one step forward. So what I'm asking you to do is to for, you, you can't forgive all at one time on some stuff that's just hard, but you can forgive one thing. You can forgive something about it. So I want you to take just a few minutes uh, and think what that is. Wrestle that out with God for a couple minutes. If y'all remember when uh, Sheila spoke on strongholds, she said, how's the stronghold built? Well, it's one Stone at a time until you stand back and, wow, it's this giant castle that won't move. Well, how do you dismantle it in a lot of cases? You just take it down one stone at a time. That's why it's important to make a step forward in forgiveness especially because I know how we feel. We feel like we want to hurt that person or we want them held responsible. But what happens is we're hurt. We're the ones in jail. But the thing is, we have the keys in our hand. We have the keys in our hand. So I feel like the Lord is saying tonight, one thing, just one part of it. That's all he's asking. So everybody close your eyes for just a minute. We'll have uh, maybe two sets of altar ministers up here, one on each side. And if you need extra prayer, you can come up here to them. 
But for, for the most part, I want this just between, between us and God. And when I start to pray at the end, if you need to, you can come forward. So, Lord, we know you are kind and compassionate and you've, you've been forgiving towards us. And we do not want to withhold that from someone else just because they've hurt us or somebody in our family, Lord. And so I'm asking for the strength and the grace to be able to do what you're telling us to do. We know we need to be able to forgive, Lord. We know that. And so we ask for your grace to do that. This is a hard thing. It's hard for us humans to do this, Lord. And so we need your spirit operating through us to make this happen. We, all we can tell you tonight is we're willing to move one step forward. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for your compassion and, and generosity. And I even thank you for Jonah, who shows us that we do not we do not want to hold on to that unforgiveness and that bitterness because it will destroy us. In Jesus' name, amen.